As I share the screen, I, I want to uh, affirm that I realize that this study, because God's word is so powerful, could open within us pain that we have not felt or have not uh, even realized have been um, festering in our hearts and our lives. Um, no different than limitations causing, calling us to lament individually and as a society. I would like to lift up a message of hope for you this evening that you may feel um, an extra sense of grief or despair because of this study. And so with that, I would like to invite you um, to always know that I'm here for you. If you need to talk or share or just need someone, a shoulder to cry on, I'm here for you. Also, I found this wonderful site it's a site for Rhode Island. It's called Hope Health. Um, you will see a link provided in the video that you're watching now. And this is a, 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 a support group for grief. Lamentation is going to, and this study is going to also reveal um, revelations within how we can find healing in our lament. But the study does not allow for me necessarily to overly emphasize that at each study each week. So if you feel overwhelmed in grief as you open yourselves up to open oneself up, <clears throat> taking a solid, a real look at, at the grief before us in our lives, um, this is a wonderful site that you can find uh, support. You will see that as I scroll down, that there are very intimate and individual support groups for very specific areas of grief. And you'll also note that many of them are held virtually. Well, I'd like to welcome you who are joining us on, on Zoom, and I'd like to welcome those who are joining us on YouTube as we begin our third chapter of Lamentations, a series of three and five. As I prepare to open us in prayer this evening, I would like to draw your attention to the website that I shared last week. It is a grief hotline that has all different forms of seeking professional ways to communicate our grief. As I continue to do this series, I realize that this could this limitate this exercise on limitation could very well open us up and find ourselves a need to chat with somebody. One of the big elements that we are going to now be exploring as we transcend into the second part of lamentation is who is the one, who not only who is lamenting, but who is receiving the lament. And at this point, we see that it's an individual lament and a communal lament. We see that by lamenting to God, that in tonight's chapter, we're gonna see a tra transitioning into comfort within our lament. And we're going to look at how we find comfort by lamenting to God, but also as a community laments, we find comfort from our community. So with that being said, I invite us to uh, center ourselves in prayer. Oh, gracious and precious Lord, we open our hearts wide to you this evening. We thank you for this time of fellowship, a time of community. As we come to you this evening, Lord, in your word, we pray that you meet us intimately within your word and that we may find comfort and truth through you. And gracious Lord, we pray the living word in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. Amen. As I sent out a couple of brief questions, I'd like to open with those questions for us to start. We may not directly address them in this moment, but before the night is over, we will make sure we do. But the first question I asked you all was, as you read the book of Lamentations, uh, what's in chapter three particularly, or in relationship to other chapters, what stood out to you? What did you like? What concerned you? And what questions do you have? Did this happen 70 BC? The reason I'm asking is because in one part I was reading that, well, let me quickly turn to it. Um, 
It says, Lamentations points beyond the humiliation of Jerusalem to the humiliation and exaltation of Christ. Okay. But if it was 70 BC, that was before Christ. We have to be, we have to recognize that the fall of Jerusalem happened more than once. Yes. A closer time would be uh, 500 uh, BC. Oh, okay. And we have David's reign and the people thought that the reign wouldn't end. They, they, they truly believed this was going to be the fulfillment. And then um, King Solomon, the wisest of kings, <laughs> I wonder sometimes, we'll have to do a study, if that is tongue in cheek. Because King Solomon did a lot of things that aren't very wise based on the Jewish law. I'll digress. Jerusalem fell. And in this context, we're in 580 some odd year BC, BCE, before Common Era, before Christ. And we find that they're in a they're in a great despair because not only was it ransacked, but they are displaced. Okay. So that what makes this extra problematic is by general census, by general understanding, the people can only worship in Jerusalem. They can only worship in the temple. Now, to your point, Linda, at 70, um, at the, with, the, with Rome sacked Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, um, that date is probably fresh in your mind. That's the 70 um, common era after Christ. Um, but nevertheless, the people were in Jerusalem during Christ's time. They had the temple. During this time in ancient history, the people were scattered throughout the land, and there is no temple for them to worship. And if there's no temple, then God has forsaken them. Meaning, Well, I don't know if God forsaken them is the right way to say it. They have no access. That's a better word. They have no access to God because God is in the temple. Now, now I'm going to share with you a brief story that you're familiar with, which is Ezekiel's wheel. A wheel within the wheel. Many people like the story today in the secular world because they believe they're talking about aliens. Well, if you remember it of our ancient, of our Old Testament, what made the tabernacle, uh, what made the temple so holy was the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, which dwelled within the temple. So, and there's all sorts of priestly rituals and such that go along with this. Ezekiel's wheel is a time when the people were still scattered throughout the land. And because they could not go to God, Ezekiel is describing the Ark of the Covenant leaving the temple and reaching the four corners of the world. The wheel in the wheel is the temple has not, God has now left the building. Okay, now this is really important. God is contained in the story of Moses to a, a mountain pillar of smoke. Moses can go to God by climbing that mountain. God commands the people to make the ark and God goes with them wherever they go in this ark. So as they roam the wilderness, God is with them. When they make it into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, they build their temple, the temple. God dwells in a tent until King David commissions the temple built under Solomon's rule. The ark is now in this home. To everything I just said, right? The people, because from their words, 
have sinned against God, has a lot, God has allowed their enemy to destroy Jerusalem. <clears throat> they are now scattered away from the temple, therefore separate from God. Ezekiel's wheel tells us that although we are limited in approaching God, God still makes a way. Now, I've been holding this story for three weeks because I think we see today a transition within the story. But it's 580 some odd years is where they figure this is taking place. Now, the commentary is doing what it does. It's making reference to Jesus Christ. Now, picture the story I just shared with you. And the reason I shared this story with you, and I've shared it with you before, is let us take a look <clears throat> at Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says in the Gospel of John that him and his father are one, that he is God the Father. He becomes the holy tabernacle. tabernacle. Jesus Christ is the tabernacle walking amongst the people. And like the captivity that is taking place, because of our sins, the people, were, they believe they were scattered away from God. Because of our sins, we are now separated from God once again through Christ's crucifixion. But like Ezekiel's wheel, the flame of God going off to the four corners of the world, we have Pentecost. We have the Holy Spirit descending back down. One of the mistakes that Bible commentaries make often is they always talk about the Old Testament as the fulfillment, right? Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. However, the reality is God continues to do what God does, perhaps in different ways. The ark has left the building. Pentecost Sunday is upon us. I would say a promotion or an elevation each time. But nevertheless, it's not just or even a fulfillment of rather than God is doing it again. We wait again for the second coming, knowing that when the second coming comes, that will be it. But they knew that they known this over and over again in the Bible. They've always predicted that this was it. During King David's reign, they believed this was it. When Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem, they said, this is it. When Jesus died on the cross, they knew no different than the people in Lamentations that something went wrong. Pentecost comes. The Holy Spirit descends upon us. They thought this was it. And then a generation goes by and the temple is destroyed. And they say something has gone wrong. So try to think one of the things that's really hard for us because our commentaries are always telling us the second coming is here. I like to think of it more as God is doing it again. For how many generations forward, I don't know. But I know God continues throughout our holy scriptures, throughout all the way to the New Testament, into Revelation where we try so hard to have our mind get around, when will that final day be? We lose sight of the fact that Revelation is saying God is going to continually do it again and again and again. One of the big differences, however, in Lamentation in our world today is Lamentation is taking full accountability for their sin. Today, we like to blame others for why we are being punished for sin rather than taking account of ourselves. Today we see when it comes to the nationalization of Christianity in America, once again, there is a group of people that like to blame everyone else on why <clears throat> we are suffering and waiting. Everything it is, it is true that if we do not learn our history, we are destined to repeat it. It is true because that's what we do perpetually. Was there anything else that you wanted to share, either one of you, about what, what stood out to you, what you liked, what concerned you? I, I was just pleased that um, the last few sessions, 
felt so much like just lamenting. And now we're getting a feel for God's love and loyalty and mercy. And I, I needed that. I was ready for that. <laughs> Yeah, we're in chapter three, the halfway point, and in the middle of chapter three, I see a transition of the very hope that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I would say it's tribute to the poetic construction of the lament. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you reflected on... Um, the author's ultimate view of God. And if any of this ultimate view communicated with you today. I saw hope. Um, not that. Not that we were destined to be. Left alone, but that there was hope that God was with us. The section that talked about the renewal of God's mercy through the night, getting us safely through the night, mm -hmm. that foreshadow of death, uh, you know, that it made you feel like even in our sleep, God's there waiting for us in the morning to renew for us and to renew with us. Did, did we, do we, do we have a hard time seeing hope in chapters one and two. We haven't, this is our third weekend and, and this is the first time I believe that this word came up, that we saw hope, we saw that we're not left alone. Did we, did we, did you feel, it's not a trick question, did you feel this way in chapters one and two? No, and that's why I think you said you felt ready for it, right? I also like the notion of um, active resting, that we're not just going to be quietly sitting around waiting um, for God's time, but that we will be actively resting. So some peace of mind knowing um, that God, it will be in God's time, but we're not just to sit idle by that. You know, what does that mean then? How do we go forward actively resting? I love that notion, but I'm wondering how other people might have looked at that. Mm. Do you have anything to add, Linda? No, not really. Um, I agree that chapter three was more uplifting. Uh, more hope that things aren't as bad as they could be. Yeah. Yeah. I started this series saying that limitations is the kind of study that is very tempting to pass by. To, to maybe just focus on one section. And I guess this would be the section to want to focus on. But with that being said, I also shared how limitations is necessary because without it, the Bible would be missing something. And I suppose limitations wouldn't, would also not be able to stand if it wasn't for this feeling of hope in chapter three. So with that being said, in our transition, Tonight, I'm going to try to reveal, well, I'm not, not going to force it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show some areas where I believe that the hope that comes forth in chapter three can actually, the mindset in which the hope is expressed, perhaps we can now look with hindsight to chapters one and two in a new perspective that also can lead us into hope. If not us, I wish to illustrate how the people 
would look at Lamentations chapter one and two in the highlight of number three as, of, as hopeful. Another mistake that we often do when we study the Bible is we look at it as a linear historical event that people are reading with revelation for the first time. Meaning, I always pictured someone reading it and saying, oh, wow, what's next? Oh, wow, what's next? Now, of course, when anybody learns anything new, they have to understand it for the first time. But Lamentation, within the books it's placed, it fits right along with Psalms, does it not? It fits along with Proverbs, does it not? It is their hymnal. It is their Catholic, <laughs> is this sacrilegium to say for Jewish, Jewish people to have a Catholic missile? Mm -hmm. It is their bulletin. It is their worship guide. It is not something that they would read one and done. It is who they are in their worship. I think, although we probably most of us know this, I think that it's easy to forget. Mm -hmm. And, and as such, let us be mindful that through the worship, worship service of lamentation and used as their worship guide, I have the book of worship, the United Methodist book of worship. I have the Anglican book of prayer, common prayer, their book of worship, John Wesley's book of worship. I have a missile, Catholic book of worship. We have Lamentations, one of the Jewish books of worship. And as such, they know it from chapter one and chapter five. It's like listening to your favorite or watching, reading your favorite book over again. It's like listening to your favorite song. It's like watching a movie more than once. It makes it worthwhile because they know what happens next. Now, maybe when it was being written, they didn't know what was happening next, but they put their hope, their trust in the one that holds the future, that has the power. How easy it would be for them to surrender and to worship the gods of Babylonia. How easy it would be for them to conform to the culture in which they are enslaved. But they held their trust to the great I am, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses. They hold to that hope so strongly that their enemies do not even get credit for the persecution that they are facing. How strong is our worship? How strong is our belief in God? As I shared a moment ago, it seems that in the contemporary context of conservative Christianity, that is being nationalized in our nation right now. It seems that people are quick to blame others. Even, I said this a few weeks ago, even free will. But the people in Lamentations give so much, so much credit to God that even their pain is given to them by God. That's hard for us to get our mind around. It's hard for me to get my mind around. But their image of God is so powerful that they find comfort in the fact that God is the one punishing them rather than their enemies. I'm going to let us soak on that for a minute. That's not easy. Can we find comfort in that?
Their punishment is coming from God rather than their enemies. And if we need to, if we need to anthropomorphize God in this context from the people's perspective, remember, this is how the people are understanding God. And if this is an image that they needed to create, I'm asking you to play along for a moment. I know this can be, this can offend people when I say this kind of thing, but even if it's in the mind's eye of the imagination creating this theology from the people during this time period, can we see that the trauma that is being taking place in their lives by the Babylonians offers them a type of liberation saying that they are not nearly as powerful as they think they are. My mind now goes to the cross. My mind goes to the cross when Pontius Pilate says, don't you understand that I have the power to crucify you or to set you free? And Jesus says, right out of limitations, you have no power over me. It is given by God. This is God's will. I go to the cross, not your will. It's interesting because limitation at first read can go against our core understanding in our theologies and our understanding on God. But if we stop and reflect on it without really any other guidance from, from any kind of big theological book, mm -hmm. we see that Jesus gives us this theology. Mm -hmm. Rome, you think you're powerful? Yeah, sure, you can knock the, you can, you can knock the temple down, but only because God allowed it, allows it. You think you're oppressing us? You're not oppressing us. We've oppressed ourselves by, by, by not being within the will of God. Perhaps it's a hard theology for a spoiled culture. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's an easier theology for those to understand who are absolutely oppressed within a society, perhaps. Any thoughts on the comments I, I stated? I wanted to share with all of you a slide from last week. Okay, on this slide, it shows us um, lament poems in the Bible. Last week, I gave an assignment on your own to look up some Psalms. I offered up Psalm 10, 63, 69, 74, 79. And the assignment was as you read through the Psalms to see if you could find these three styles of lament, a form to protest, a, a way to process emotion, and a place to voice confusion. For those that are joining us on YouTube, if you would like to take time to do so now, you may do so by just pausing the video and returning when you're ready. But I was wondering if any of you, if, um, if, you, if anyone did this exercise, then I would like to invite you at your own leisure to perhaps do so, at, at, not, not now, but later on. What, I, what I'm trying to show here, and I'm not alone, is a statement I said a little while ago about how there are different sections in the book, in the Bible, and in, in the different books, and how they work together. And many of you already know that, that Psalms offers us areas of lament. Mm -hmm. And what particularly I wanted us to see is a lament offers us a minimum, or lamentations that is, offers us at least three forms to which we can see God giving us permission to turn to God with. 
we can see that we are given permission to protest. We are seeing we are giving a way to process emotion and a place to voice confusion. Okay, if we look at Lamentations solely as a way for us to understand God in God's role of why we suffer, we are missing part of the exercise. We are missing a large part. What lamentation offers us is not an easy, if an answer at all, besides sin, on why we are punished or why we suffer or why things happen the way they do. We are missing a huge point. The answer is sin. Fine. Which sin? What sin? Who sin? Well, we can investigate that and we can get some ideas of what sin that was taking place in their mind's eye. But that is not the main purpose, if I dare say, of why limitations exist. Limitations offers us the theological expression, not just understanding. It offers us the gift of worship. I love that. Worship is not something that we have designed. Worship is not something we created. God created worship. God created worship. So arrogant humans are that we think we created worship. God has given us worship. And here God tells us how we can come to God in our pain, in our suffering. One, God gives us permission to protest. Think about that. Have you ever been told, that's blasphemy. Don't say that. Don't think, even think that. God gives us permission to protest. To protest what? Our pain, our confusion our emotion. This is big. The creator of the universe did not create one and done and let us go and say, oh, you messed up, you sinned. For if you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. Move on. God meets us in our brokenness, in the huge word sin. Why does God allow bad things to happen? Well, limitation says sin, but even bigger, because that's as close as we can get, right? That's as close as we can get to understanding. We don't know why God does, but we know God offers us a place to meet God, even when we're alienated from the temple of Jerusalem and are in a foreign land. We can protest. Lamenting allows us the opportunity to process emotion. It offers us a place to voice our confusion. I believe the Bible is not a theoretical place for us to turn to God, but it is a reality. And as such, I would like to talk a little bit about psychology. God created our minds. God creates our imagination. And through our wisdom, we understand psychology. And as such, many a person goes to counseling. Many a person uh, takes medication to help because we are biological beings. We are we have psychologically understood that there are processes. Now, some people put 100% faith in science, if you will. But in psychology, there is something to be said about the relationship of processing emotion. 
In psychology, you can receive a BA and a B or a BX because everything psychological is biological. Everything biological is also psychological. We need to process. We are, we have a soul. Sometimes we need to look at things more biologically and other times we need to talk it through. Sigmund Freud's techniques are hardly ever used today, although they are still taught because there is truth in the process of trying to understand working out our, our struggles of who we are. God is emphasizing this to us. An atheist can find truth and help psychologically in these three forms of lament that are giving to us and lamentations. If we do not process our emotions, we are trapped in them. How do we process our emotions? The first thing we need to do is, is to just protest them. At a funeral, very few times have I ever heard somebody to tell someone else to stop crying. That's just raw protest, primal emotion coming out. Here, we see it taken up a level where not only can the tears go forth, but they are protesting it to their, to our God. Why did this happen? The unanswerable question to which I will say the psalmist in Lamentation truly does not answer. He gives the big answer, right? Sin, brokenness, broken world. But, but, but in the end, we don't know. But through the voicing of our pain, we are processing our emotion. I don't understand this. Our lamenting gives us a place to voice our confusion, to continue this process. Whether one believes in God or not, I will emphatically say that all three of these forms of lamenting is necessary to even begin the healing process. Most people think it's not. Most people think that you can just forget it and it will go away. That is not true. If there's one thing I learned as a pastor, in the years that I've been serving, is you, you will lament in one way or another. It will work its way out, or it will, or it will kill you, or you will die with it. Only when we process these three forms of lament that is given to us in Lamentations will we find healing. I believe if I presented this in a different way, in a different time, in a different class, I had nothing to do with the Bible. I believe that if I presented this in one of my papers for psychology, I think the professor would say, you're absolutely right. I know if I presented this in child development, whether it be Eric Erickson or some other great child psychologist, they would say, absolutely. Because if you don't do these three things, you will regress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So what am I saying? Well, in a nutshell, I'm saying not only are these biblical, they're biological because we are biological because of our biblical creator. They go together. You know, I often am mystified on why there's so much debate between science and our text. If we would understand that the author of Lamentation is talking to us to our soul. He says, our soul needs this because we are suffered so. We can relate to that. And thank God, rather than finding a place where we feel guilty, God is giving us permission 
to put it all on him, to blame him, to blame ourselves, to not have any answers, but all needs to be processed. It's so practical. It's so practical, at, as a matter of fact, that most Christians miss it and rather go into denial. Well, after all, God's got it all under control. There's no reason for me to feel this way. Perhaps, but God says, give it to me. Let it all out. All right. Let us pause. Shared, um, <coughs> validated. When I look back at certain moments in my life, it's validated times that I had to do this. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't think of it as this process, but it's validated uh, some times that I dealt with a certain circumstance and maybe encouraging me to do it a little more. I'm sure that there are areas that I, as you kind of said, you know, you yeah. put them under the rug, but. Um, Is it not true? I think a lot of people do feel guilty when they doubt. And, and when they're mad, let, let's face it. I think a lot of people are mad at God when bad things happen. And, and dare I say, from the perspective in which I can see it too, I, I agree with them. But, but I'll pretend not to. Is that what God's asking for us? Now, now you may say, Barry, how do you know this? And I say, I don't. All I'm telling you is what I'm hearing when I read Lamentations. When I don't go right to the resurrection, but stay on the cross, I don't see, I don't go where most people go and overemphasize the why we're suffering but what we can do with the suffering. Because friends, in the end, we're never going to know on this side of the eternity why. That's out, that I can guarantee you is outside of my pay grade. I have learned enough to say to you tonight, and I am mature enough to say to you tonight, I don't know, and I don't expect to know. I wouldn't have given you a different answer. I would have gave you a more definitive answer years ago on why. But I can honestly tell you, I don't know. But I know I can, I can do, I know I have not only the permission, but I believe the gift to protest, to process, and to voice my confusion in raw lament. And I know from my pastoral experience, meeting people one-on-one, -on -one, meaning not my biblical experience, but just meeting with people, that it's only when we lament in such a way that we do find healing on this side of eternity. Could I start our um, scripture reading for this evening? Mm -hmm. As I prepare to start our scripture reading, I'd like you to ask yourselves this. Well, keep your mind open. Um, I'm going to make the suggestion that it, it sounds a lot like chapters one and two, but would you focus on this one question? Who is listening to this lament? Who is this lament going to? And I will share the screen. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains, even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. Like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me. 
and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughingstock of all my people. They mocked me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Somebody tell me what we're hearing there. A suffering soul. We see, um, we see the crucifixion, do we not? Jesus on the, um, the bitterness and, and the gall. Um, I, I, you gave me gu uh, gall to drink. It's, uh, I can only, I, when I hear this, it's hard for me to separate my Christianity from it. I, I, I hear the suffering Christ. Okay. Any other thoughts before we ask, before we go to the question? Okay, so the question was, who is the, um, who is the one listening to the lament? Chapters one, chapters two, and now chapter three. Who do we think is he lamenting to? I thought to God. Lamenting to God. I and think he's speaking to the other people, the suffering as well. Yeah, right. He's speaking. He's speaking to us, who is also lamenting, but. But he's lamenting to the all-powerful, all-knowing God. Who is he blaming in the lament? Mm -hmm. Over and over, he, 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 he being God. Not the Babylonians, but God. Have you ever, oh, all right, I want to be, I want to be gentle. Sometimes my study gets ahead of me. Have you ever heard people facing their accuser in court when they're being sentenced? Oftentimes, people don't get the closure that they thought they would get, particularly when the person doesn't have any remorse. Not always the case, but sometimes. People often falsely believe that when justice comes upon the person that harmed them, they will be healed. This is one of the reasons why we have such a hard time forgiving others because we don't wanna let them off the hook. But here, the person lamenting is not cursing out those that are in his vision that are hurting him, the Babylonians. He's confronting God. Is there liberation in giving God the power for our suffering? over our enemies. Is, if you are in a situation where we cannot find liberation from our oppressors, 
can we find liberation by recognizing that it is indeed God inflicting rather than a particular tribe or people? I'm thinking of uh, the news lately. Okay. I'm thinking lately of the of news stories on global warming. And it reminds me of uh, the book I had read back in college, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, where she gave warnings about taking care of our planet. And I know sometimes myself, it's easy to say, well, it's the oil companies that pollute, and it's the it's this group that pollutes, and it's that group that pollutes. Rather than say maybe some of what we see happening with the environment is God letting us know <laughs> we are astray, and by we it has to be me too. So, so how do I lessen my uh, print? on all of this, how do I take ownership? But it feels helpless because you're only one person. Um, I've been thinking of this with lamentations and I've been kind of equating it with what I see happening to the environment. As a child, I remember driving uh, to in the car and seeing smokestacks and being upset about the pollution. And it's easy to, to want to point fingers at all the industry or all the indiscriminate acts that happen without our own ownership. But by, by just saying, well, God's punishing us, I don't know how that gets us off the So I'm a little in a, uh, I'm a little bit in a loop over it all. You know something, I, I, I agree with you, Kathy, but I think like this heat wave that we're experiencing right now, maybe it's God saying, pay attention, listen, S something bad is happening, but maybe God is sending us a warning. I agree. I just don't know that meant uh, about it and then how to take my own personal responsibility in it. Because it's so hard to look at the big picture and realize that you don't have a role in every single, you don't have a role in all the that have created this. And yet, when I do like buy less plastic or recycle, I feel like it's just a little drop in the bucket. And God, nothing positive seems to be happening. Yeah. And so that's only in this one area. And, and so many areas in our world that we lament about. It's tough. Maybe I could just add one, one thought on it. It seems like the environment was the one that keeps coming into it. I'll add this, if I may, and then we'll talk about this next week, this whole theme. We sometimes forget that it's not just humans. That just shows human arrogance. It's not just humans suffer from the sin or the brokenness of the fall, but the scriptures say all of creation groans along with it. And that's what I, that's what I hear when I listen to you both. Before I try to calculate it out, I want to lament that that creation is crying out along with us. And maybe, to Linda's point, right, maybe this is the warning from it. Or, or to your point, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's these things, but, 
But I'm going to take it one step back and then say, yes, it's true, isn't it? Even creation's lamenting. You say this heat wave is, boy, that's something in itself, isn't it? That one statement. As I think about what you both shared, it's not just the psalmist who's lamenting, but it's creation. It's, is it okay for me to say Mother Earth? In the spirit in which I intend it, I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask that we reflect upon what both, both of you shared. Okay. What I would like us to do next is I'd like to continue the scripture reading if you feel we're ready to move on. I would like to spend some time tonight on sitting Shiva, <clears throat> the Jewish tradition. And, and our next scripture reading is um, going to be picking up to the transition. This is part two, I saw the transition of the word that you both shared tonight, hope. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust, 
there may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion, so great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone, to crush underfoot all prisoners in the land, to deny people their rights before the Most High, to deprive them of justice, would not the Lord see such things? Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Why should the living complain when punished for their sins? Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, We have sinned and rebelled, and you have not forgiven. You have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain without pity. You have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can get through. You have made us scum and refuse among the nations. All our enemies have opened their mouths wide against us. We have suffered terror and pitfalls, ruin and destruction. Streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed. My eyes will flow unceasingly without relief until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees. What I see brings grief to my soul because of all the women of my city. Those who were my enemies without cause hunted me like a bird. They tried to end my life in a pit and threw stones at me. The waters closed over my head, and I thought I was about to perish. I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you, and you said, Do not fear. You, Lord, took up my case. You redeemed my life. Lord, you have seen the wrong done to me. Uphold my cause. You have seen the depth of their vengeance, all their plots against me. Lord, you have heard their insults, all their plots against me. What my enemies whisper and mutter against me all day long. Look at them, sitting or standing, they mock me in their songs. Pay them back what they deserve, Lord, for what their hands have done. Put a veil over their hearts, and may your curse be on them. Pursue them in anger and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. Okay, observations. I think today, when we hear of the war in Ukraine, or the forest fires in the West, or whatever it might be, we too turn to God and ask for relief. I, I think and not, not to take away from what you're saying, Linda, and I hope you don't take it that I am. I think what you just shared is where most people want to start in limitation, right? Like, finally, finally, now we can come to God, right? Why in the world? This is where we want to be, right? We want to start in chat. And for me, anyway, correct me if I'm wrong, but we want to start going to God. We don't even want to spend time lamenting. I love verse 22, chapter three, verse 22, right? It's just, that's where it all starts. That's where it starts to get good, right? Um, well, actually uh, we can go back uh, to 20. I will remember them and my soul is cast down with me. And yet this, and, and yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Mm -hmm. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. This is what we hear. We're Christians, right? This is what we do. So, so to, to Linda's point, I say, amen. Um, but I want to strongly draw our attention to the fact that the psalmist waits 
halfway through, the lamentist waits halfway through his book <laughs> to begin this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for me, I can't escape that. I just can't. Like, I have no problems with lamentation starting in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 20. But that's not where he starts. <laughs> oh, okay, I will digress because we are going to pick that up. We're going to pick up on that. What I want us to focus on for tonight in our closing 15 minutes, our last 15 minutes, is verse 28. Verse 28 says, let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him. And let him be filled with disgrace. This is a very powerful sonnet. This is a transition. We are mindful that we lament. We are given permission to lament with everything we have but who do we lament to and once we are reassured that we lament to the one that we always have hope in this that we still have hope because the lord's great love will not consume us there's a sermon man that preaches doesn't it because the Lord's great love will not be consumed. We are not consumed. For his compassion never fails. Now what? Rest. Let us now sit alone in silence that the Lord has laid upon him. It is time for us to soak, dare I say, stage two of our healing is to cry out, to scream before the Lord. Why, how could you, why could you? And then remember that although I don't understand, now is the time for me to be mindful that I do trust in you as much as I, angry with you as much as I hate you now in my pain I still trust in you and now the most hardest thing for me to ever do is shh, be silent We go to a funeral and the person cries and we say, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss, but he is in a better place or she is in a better place. I'm sorry, I know what you're going through must be hard. God has a special place in heaven for little angels. Perhaps that's why God took him or her so young all things that i hope upon all hopes that people say because they want to comfort but not realizing that those words do exactly the opposite of mm -hmm. i've shared with you all and anyone who knows me that one of the biggest things they teach us in seminary when it comes to comforting somebody is to part of my language, but shut up. One of the biggest things they teach us pastors throughout our journey is to stop putting your foot in your mouth and just be quiet. Take all of this theology and how great you know God is and use it to keep your mouth quiet for those that are grieving. Dare I say we're given the proof text right here in chapter 3, verse 28. Pastors, let that person sit alone in silence. Is it saying 
let them be totally alone? I say no, for this is a communal pain, prayer. This is a communal lament. But it's saying you don't need to fill this with anything other than the silence because the lament is too great. We don't know why sin. We know that the all-powerful God is allowing this to happen because of sin. What else can be said? God has your baby into a little angel. Maybe God took your child young so he'd be protected or she'd be protected from a future. Those aren't company. I've heard them all. So, out of the Jewish tradition, they have, I believe, strongly came out of this, although I did not do the research. That's not where I was taking this study. I thought of sitting Shiva. Sitting Shiva, as some of you know, and some of you may not, is a Jewish tradition that's held to this day. <clears throat> I'll share just a little bit on it, and then I would like to share a clip. We're going to talk in more detail about this in the, next, in the following weeks. But out of the spirit of Shiva, I wanted to have it speak for itself a little. So I'm not going to give too much pretext or post-text, but just what it is. Sitting Shiva, S-H-I-V-A-H, is the most common and sometimes spelt with two A's, S-H-I-V-A-A-H, is the most common time to console mourners is during Shiva, seven. The seven day mourning period that follows burial. Visitors come to the Shiva house or the Shiva home where the mourners are said to be sitting Shiva. This is not simply a social visit. The aim is to show the mourner that the one is concerned about, that one is concerned about his or her distress. Concern for the mourner should be paramount. The classic code of Jewish law states that the consolers are not to speak until the mourner speaks. Do not speak until spoken to. There is no expectations upon the mourner to do anything. But the expectation is on the pawn, the person that has come to console the one that is mourning. The mourner sits in at the front of the room. And once he or she nods to indicate that the, cons that the consoler should leave. And when they nod to tell them to leave, they are not permitted to remain any longer. Listen, Jewish tradition is very much like our own. We are called to be very hospitable. The Jews are, are no different. You come into someone's house, you do, it would be rude to do any of these things. But no, it is rude. It is not about the visitors in this time. It is about the person mourning. And when they had enough of your presence, you may go. One should visit the Shiva's house of a mourner who is a friend or a relative, a member of one's community, or a mourner who has no other visitors. Ideally, it is best not to disturb the Shiva while entering during the hours of mourning um, uh, the mourners may uh, want visitors, and the visitors should be careful not to tire the one that's more that's doing the mourning, or engage in small talk. Small talk is taboo. I love this tradition. I don't know what to say. The Jewish tradition of sitting shiva is perfect. Don't say anything. Your presence is enough. 
the traditional sentence of consult, consolation, consolation is to conclude the visit by saying, may you be comforted from heaven. May God console you together with everyone who mourns you for Zion and Jerusalem. We've heard these two words before, haven't we? Zion and Jerusalem. It seems to me like lamentations is being practically applied within the lives of those that are mourning. We are going to talk more about Jerusalem and Zion. I haven't forgot in chapter one. I have come to this conclusion, or maybe conclusion is the wrong word. I have come to this reality of how to be a presence when someone's mourning with much time and study and over the years. Lamentations already tells us this. The Jewish tradition understands this. Use your strength, your belief in God in this moment to be a silent presence for them. I'd like to now share this brief video with you. Jewish mourning customs are specifically designed to make sure that the mourner has time and space to grieve away from their daily routine and to help you, their friend, make sure that they are comforted and sustained. Often while a Jewish mourner is at the funeral, community members are preparing a space, usually a family home, for the period known as Shiva. The mourners stay inside to reflect on the life of the person who died, receive visitors, pray, and grieve. Mourners are not expected to entertain, rather the opposite. The community provides meals and a comforting presence for the mourners during this period. Don't wait for an invitation. It's an important mitzvah to visit your friend at the Shiva home after they've lost their loved one. You may witness some customs that seem unusual, such as the covering of mirrors, the mourner sitting low to the floor, a tear in their clothing, or the burning of a seven-day candle. Any questions? When do I visit? Shiva is traditionally observed for one week following the death. If the family hasn't announced or publicized a list of visit times, call the funeral home or synagogue or give a call over to the house before stopping by. What should I bring? Find out if there is a coordinated effort of meals being prepared for the family that you can participate in. Otherwise, a basket of fresh, uncut fruit is a thoughtful and practical addition to any Shiva home. What should I say? You don't have to say anything. It's enough to be present. Let the mourner set both the pace and tone of the conversation. Once the mourner speaks to you, you can offer condolences and, if it feels right, share memories of the deceased. Elements of the Jewish mourning process continue beyond the seven days of Shiva, 30 days for most mourners, and 11 months for those who have lost a parent. It's important for you to be supportive of your friend and help keep the memory of their loved one alive for the years to come. Some ways to do this are by making a charitable donation in the name of the deceased to a cause important to you or to them. Contacting your friend near holiday times when they might especially be thinking of family or attending synagogue with them for the anniversary of their loved one's death. People have told me I don't like reading the Psalms, they're too depressing. Another person shared with me, I'm not gonna do limitations with you, it's too depressing. I get it. But tonight I feel a little different. The first two nights of our study, the two weeks were really tough on me. But tonight, I, I, don't, I don't wanna speak for you, you don't have to feel this way, but I feel, I feel hopeful. Limitation is tiring, but so is in mourning and grieving. Next week, we're gonna talk a little bit more about Shiva and how our traditions maybe coincide very much like it or, or differently then. I'd like, to, I'm gonna share a little bit about how we today have lost some of the traditions of Shiva that we once, we once held. And, I, and as we continue in our lamentation study in chapter four, 
I'll be sending out an email within the next day or two, preparing us for our next lesson. But I would invite you, and I noticed that you both took down notes for the Psalms. I would ask us to revisit the Psalms that were suggested in the, in the uh, three uh, purposes of lament outline, but also to spend some time if, if you want to in um, revisiting the text from what we now see in chapter three. Is there anything pressing on anyone they'd like to share before I close this in prayer? Then let us pray. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for offering us such raw and honest emotion with you. We thank you, oh Lord, for the community in which you have called us to. Gracious Lord, as we prepare ourselves for this evening's rest, help us to find comfort in your love, in your grace, in your power, in your majesty. And may the words from your scriptures continue to resonate within us as we are comforted by your love. We pray to you now, the author of love, as demonstrated through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me this evening. I think, and I, I'm glad to be part of in this group with you as well. Thank you. I'll see you all soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.